Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hank Meyer, Vice Chairman of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. And I also have the distinct honor in that role of co-chairing the program committee of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation with Susan Ford Bales. Susan, many of you know from so many of her works and her relationship with people in Grand Rapids. Uh, she's going to be back here again in September with Susan G. Coleman as she champions her mother's cause in breast cancer research. And more recently, her, much of her time and passion has been consumed championing the particular cause of her father, and that's the strong defense of the United States in the form of her sponsorship of the USS Gerald R. Ford. And so to welcome our speaker today, I would like to introduce Grand Rapids' adoptive native daughter and our special person today, Susan Ford. Susan? I love that ship. <laughs> Just gets me going every time. Um, good afternoon. Lieutenant Governor Callie, Attorney, Attorney General Schutte, General Owens, Red Cavaney, you're going to be a resident here before you know it, Hank Meyer, Joe Calvaruso, fellow trustees and staff of Dad's Museum and Foundation, Wally Tett, once again, thank you for making the day so special. Distinguished guests, Uncle Dick, ladies and gentlemen. In the twilight of his life, Dad often asked how to reflect on his legacy. And his decades of public service and his response surprised many. Certainly, Dad was proud of how he healed the nation following our greatest constitutional crisis since the Civil War. And he was equally proud of the bipartisan leadership in Congress and on behalf of the citizens of Grand Rapids and for the nation as our president. But the part of his legacy about which Dad was the proudest was the group of men and women who were the core of his administration and who went out to serve the American people with exceptional and distinguished service. And no one better illustrates that than Dad's pride in this remarkable group other than our special guest today. With his always present humility, our guest often describes with amazement when Dad first summoned him from the, com from the Commerce Department. Then he quickly became one of Dad's closest advisors. But rest assured, Dad knew exactly why this humble Texan was so extraordinary. He went on to serve Dad with distinction, and then, as the saying goes, the rest is history. In the years after his service to Dad, he served as the 61st United States Secretary of State, the 67th United States Secretary of Treasury, White House Chief of Staff for two presidents, Chairman of the Iraq Study Group, and personal representative of the Secretary General of the United, Stations, United Nations of our fellow trustees and the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. He's an honorary co-chairman, along with his wonderful wife, Susan, of the official christening committee and for the USS Gerald R. Ford. A philosopher once observed, quote, the best impression one gets of a leader and of, the, of his character is by looking at those closest around him, end quote. In the end, the legacy and the leadership of Gerald Ford is defined by our guest and by his remarkable service to America 
then please know that the 38th President of the United States would be bursting with pride today and with joy and with honor to introduce to you a statesman, a world leader, a man of peace, a man of integrity, and I'm very proud to say one of my dad's dearest friends. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Baker. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Susan, for that extraordinarily generous uh, introduction. It's a real joy for me to be back in Grand Rapids. I always enjoy uh, coming here. It's a joy to be back uh, at the Ford Library, and we had a wonderful wreath-laying ceremony uh, for President and Mrs. Ford this morning at the, at the library, and I'm just delighted to be here. I want to Pay my respects to your very able Lieutenant Governor and to your equally able uh, Attorney General who uh, came to work for me in the Ford administration as I think an 18 or 19 year old kid <laughs> when, right after President Ford asked me to take over the responsibility of being the delegate hunter for him in the 76 campaign against the primary campaign against Ronald Reagan. And Bill Schuette used to keep track of these delegates, some of these uncommitted delegates. And Red, Red Cabinet used to make arrangements for me to bring those uncommitted delegates over to the White House and meet with President Ford. And we gave it a pretty damn good shot. In fact, we, <laughs> in fact, we, we, we won that primary contest and came very close to uh, beating Jimmy Carter, losing by only 10,000 votes out of 81 million votes that were cast. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, President Obama asked me last uh, Tuesday to represent the United States at the funeral in the state of Georgia, not Atlanta, Georgia, but the country of Georgia, uh, at the death of uh, the former foreign minister of the Soviet Union, Edward Shevardnadze, who then became president of Georgia. And so I have spent the last 28 of the last 48 hours on an airplane. So if I don't put you to sleep, I may put myself to sleep. <laughs> uh, I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges facing the country today, and I'm happy to do that. But first, let me say a word or two about President Ford. Because here is a man who served his fellow Americans with such dignity and such grace during a time as has been pointed out, of really great upheaval here in our nation. In many ways, the situation in the United States today is not dissimilar from the one that Gerald Ford faced when he placed his hand on the Bible on August 9, 1974, to take the oath of office. At that time, recession was presenting the country with what could arguably have been said to be its worst economic time since the Great Depression. And we had a country that was weary of war, weary of war after the Vietnam experience. Americans, when President Ford took over the Oval Office, were really quite jaded and with some justify, justi with justification, in my view, about a political system that many felt had let them down. Our national psyche was taking a beating. Countless people worried that the American dream had become a thing of the past. And then into this national morass came a man with a, with a true, I think you, anybody would say, true moral compass. He exemplified the plain talk of a Midwesterner, the resolution of a Michigan Wolverine offensive lineman, the bravery of a Pacific war hero, and the intellect of a Yale Law School graduate. He was all of that, ladies and gentlemen, but he was much, much more. And most of all, I think I would sum it up by saying he was simply a beautiful human being. I don't know anybody that ever worked with him or for him that would disagree with that statement. He may have lacked glibness, but he had something much, much more important. He had character. He had integrity. 
Gerald Ford, as the country and indeed the entire world would soon learn, possessed some character traits that we associate oftentimes with the Boy Scouts. He was trustworthy, he was loyal, he was reverent. Of course, this shouldn't have come as a surprise since he was the first American president, after all, who earned the rank of Eagle Scout. But for President Ford, decency and honor were more than merely words that politicians throughout the ages have repeated in high-minded speeches. These were ideals, in his view, to be incorporated into the way one lived one's life. And so let me say a bit about what I believe were among President Ford's most exemplary traits, traits that contributed to his effective brand of leadership. And I think it may be particularly instructive to consider these character traits at this particular point in our country's history, because these are the very traits that are so badly needed today in Washington, where once again, confidence in our country and in our elected officials is waning. Let me start with a leadership trait that I think was his very most important, and that was his selflessness. Like most politicians, President Ford understood that winning an election meant self-preservation. But unlike too many today, he was unwilling to sacrifice his principles in order to satisfy the whims of the electorate. Faced with an enormous dilemma about whether or not to pardon President Nixon in the aftermath of Watergate, President Ford didn't look to his political consultants or advisors for advice. I know that for a fact because I was one of those advisors. <laughs> he knew what they would say. He knew that pardoning President Nixon would hurt him at the polls, and it did two years later. Instead, he did the very same thing that we tell our children to do when they are confronted with a difficult problem. He looked to his own heart for guidance. And after he found the answer, he explained it to his countrymen by saying, my conscience tells me that it is my duty to not only proclaim domestic tranquility, but to use every means that I have to ensure it. That courageous act, when the buck truly did stop at his desk, allowed the nation to move forward from a very troubling time and was the absolute right thing to do under the circumstances. I think that characteristic of selflessness is the reason President Ford was able to heal our injured country in the way that he was, even if it ultimately cost him his job. A second leadership trait that President Ford exhibited was bipartisanship, and it's been alluded to here this afternoon. A moment ago, I said that President Ford was a man of principle, and he was, make no doubt about it. He was particularly worried about the influence that an ever-growing government was having on our country. He expressed those thoughts, and he expressed them very eloquently. If the government is big enough to give you everything you want, he said, it is big enough to take away everything you have. And of course, he was absolutely right. But President Ford was also a creature of the Congress who served for more than eight years as the House Minority Leader before he became Vice President and then President. As well as anyone, he, stood that our democracy, he understood that our democracy is based upon negotiation and agreement. Truth, he once said, is the glue that holds government together. Compromise, he further said, is the oil that makes governments go. President Ford, like all politicians, had political adversaries. They come with the turf if you're a politician. But guess what? He didn't have political enemies. He knew how to disagree agreeably. President Ford understood that bipartisanship is important, not only for getting things accomplished, but for making sure that they don't get undone when there are the inevitable shifts of power in Washington, D.C. If every White House practiced the same broad-gauged approach that President Ford did almost 40 years ago, we would be a much better and a much more productive country 
because of it. A third leadership trait is the one that he demonstrated side by side with his wonderful First Lady Betty. And that, of course, was their perseverance in the face of adversity. Life did not, did not always go according to storybook plans for Jerry and Betty Ford, particularly when it came to her battles with substance abuse. But rather than do the easy thing and give in to her addiction, Betty Ford chose the difficult path. She confronted those demons that were her problem head on, and she conquered them. And then she did something even more heroic. She set about helping others to do the same thing. With President Ford always supporting her, she was able to turn trials into triumphs. If ever there was an example of how Americans should respond to the inevitable challenges that we will all face, at some time or another, the Fords were it. The tragedy of President Ford's service, of course, is that the American people did not give him a full term in office. Had they done so, I am absolutely convinced that his already sizable footprint in American history would have become even larger. Why? Because at his very core, Gerald Ford was a leader one who was guided by a clear conscience and by a dogged determination to see his country at its very best. The brand of leadership that President Ford practiced is sorely needed today in this country to confront the challenges that we face. Choices do matter, and our nation will continue to struggle if we don't start making the right choices. So the first challenge I want to note for you today is expanding free trade. And that's particularly pertinent since, since this is the William Simon lecture series. Bill Simon, of course, was a, uh, President Ford's Treasury Secretary, uh, a person with whom I worked very closely when I was at the Commerce Department. And Bill Simon was a, was a strong supporter of liberalized trade and investment. He had it right about liberal trade and investment. Bringing down barriers to U.S. trade and investment, of course, is good for American business. It's good for American workers, and it's good for the American economy. Protectionism raises prices. It stifles innovation, and it invites retaliation from our trading partners. There is a critical trade issue out there today that requires White House action and White House leadership, and that's the Trans-Pacific Partnership which is a major trade agreement between 12 Pacific Rim countries. Negotiations on that agreement are stalled. They're stalled at the same time that China is pushing for 16 Asian nations to create a competing regional comprehensive economic partnership. Government and business leaders in the region, including some of America's traditional allies, are waiting for Washington to move waiting for Washington to move decisively to seal the deal on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But sealing the deal means that the White House has got to now really make a push for stalled legislation to give President Obama fast-track authority to negotiate trade deals in order to strengthen his own hand in trade talks. Fast-track authority means that the Congress can't pick the agreements apart with many, many, many amendments, they got to vote up or down on them. The administration needs to press its Democratic allies in the Congress, particularly the Democratic majority in the Senate, to get this done. And my friends, this is a real no-brainer. We ought to be doing it. A second challenge is developing regional stability in the Middle East. When you pick up the paper today or you turn on your television set, you you quite justified in thinking, my God, what's happening in the Middle East? It's falling totally apart, and it is, particularly given what is now happening in Iraq. So we ought to be leading. The United States ought to be leading, not from behind, but from in front. That's where you normally lead from, isn't it? <laughs> so we ought to be doing that, and we ought to be developing a multilateral strategy to deal with the conflicts in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere in the region. Every country in the region has an interest in seeing the abolition or the 
or the diminution of terror. And what's happening in Iraq today is, is productive of many m more terrorist incidents, some of which are likely to reach Europe and the United States. These conflicts uh, in the Middle East today are fueling global terrorism, and therefore you need a global solution uh, to, to uh, control it. Those negotiations, in my view, ought to include every country in the region, including Israel and Iran. Now, a lot of people say, oh, you can't sit down with Iran. You can't, do, you can't get the deal done if you're not willing to sit down and talk to them. And if you know what you're doing, there's nothing wrong with sitting down and negotiating with somebody. Obviously, you've got to have Russia and China and the European Union involved. Because as I said earlier, every one of these countries has an interest in preventing the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, which now controls a lot of Syria and a lot of Iraq, from spreading its influence and terror. Americans are going over there to fight. Europeans are going over there to fight. They have American passports. They have European passports. Don't you think for one minute that they won't be coming back to their home countries to exercise a little jihad? So whether we like it or not, any effort without Iranian participation will fail. And let's not forget that Iran did cooperate with the United States when we initially went into Afghanistan in 2001. Are there a lot of obstacles to organizing such regional negotiations? You bet there are too many to list. And of course, success is not guaranteed. But I think the same can be said of most diplomatic initiatives. I'll tell you this, there's no other country out there in the world that can lead on this. And if we don't, there'll be no leadership. A third challenge facing our country is, is, is correcting what has been uh, perhaps not so charitably termed by some, a squishy foreign policy. That's one that's left too many people around the world wondering if America still says what it means and means what it says. We need to be particularly careful about making promises or threats without considering the consequences. This is particularly true when it comes to presidential declarations. Every presidential declaration is, after all, an authoritative, authoritative statement on American foreign policy. When President Obama put out his famous red line uh, on chemical weapons use statement by the Syrian government, that's a cautionary example of the disarray that an injudicious statement, however offhand it may be, can cause. American presidents should never threaten anything that they're not damn well prepared to follow through on. So we need to be consistent, we need to be clear, we need to, be all of the, we need to use all of the tools at our disposal. One example, I think, is address, is, it can, can be found in how we address Russia's outrageous seizure of Crimea and its continuous meddling in internal Ukrainian affairs. As I've said, I just came back from the country of Georgia. And the Georgians, the Moldovans, the Ukrainians, all of these countries that are now, that used to be republics of the former Soviet Union, are scared to death because they're quite concerned that uh, the way the tanks were rolled in Ukraine and Crimea could very well happen to them. And just rolling the tanks when you don't like what's going on somewhere is simply inconsistent with any concept of a stable world order. So working with our European allies, we need to maintain sanctions. If necessary, we need to ramp them up. But we also, I think, should revisit the question of the missile shield, defense shield that we were going to put in Poland and the Czech Republic, but which were canceled. We should bolster permanent army and naval forces in countries like Poland and the Baltics. And we should most of all, I think, put into place energy policies that can help wean Europe from its reliance on Russian energy. I've suggested that the president should have gone down when the, when, when the tax first rolled in Crimea. It would have been great if the president would go down to the White House briefing room and say, I hereby approve all 25 applications for the export of liquefied natural gas from the United States. That wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have taken effect until 2015 or 2016, but you would have seen the ruble go this way 
and you would have seen uh, interest rates go that way in Russia. And Russia's economy is not all that strong. And that's creating the re result we're looking for without ever firing a shot. The fourth challenge is, is climate change. Now listen, hear me good on this because I am, I am far from, any, <laughs> from an expert on, on the world's climate. But I'll tell you, I am a hunter, and I'm a fisherman, and I'm an outdoorsman who believes that it's important that we responsibly shepherd our resources for future generations. And so I could support efforts to reduce carbon emissions inside this country, but only if it's the right approach. But I think we need to be particularly wary of unilaterally reducing our carbon emissions at the risk of damaging our fragile economic recovery. And right now I'm referring to the EPA regulation having to do with existing electrical power plants. Many people believe that these regulations are gonna raise consumer prices and reduce economic growth. And they might. I don't know whether they will or not. I'm inclined to think they will. But dealing with global climate change requires a global solution. That's why it's called global <laughs> climate change. And so when we, when we get step out here, when, when we give up the, the, the steps that we can take, rather than negotiating a deal with other big emitters like China and India, we're in effect unilaterally disarming. So we ought, we, ought to be, we ought to stand ready to do that, take the steps necessary to reduce carbon emissions, but do it in conjunction with other countries. There are many other challenges confronting the nation, and maybe you want to talk about some of them in the Q&A session we're going to have in a few moments. Uh, one of them, and the biggest, I think, is our ticking federal debt bomb. We have a debt to GDP today, ladies and gentlemen, which is approaching 100%. That is simply unsustainable. No country can, can continue to, to prosper and thrive if their debt to GDP ratio is 100%. Uh, we have a tattered and antiquated immigration policy. We've got to somehow find a way to get to fundamental uh, immigration reform because we need a steady workforce and we, but we, at the same time, we do need to maintain control of our borders. Education reform is badly needed so that we Americans can compete with our counterparts in Europe, Asia, and the rest of the world. But perhaps our biggest challenge, and the one that makes it difficult for us to address our other challenges, is the political polarization that has seemed to paralyze good government in Washington and across the country. Now, I don't think we ought to be sentimental about the past. American politics has always been a contact sport. I know that. I've played it, and I've got the bruises to show for it. But it really does seem to be getting a lot worse and more unforgiving. In recent years, driven by a 24-7 news cycle that really does thrive on controversy, Washington has become a place where some consider compromise to be a dirty word. There are other reasons, of course, for our political dysfunction, including news outlets today that align themselves with one party or another, rather than view themselves as apolitical reporters. You listen to MSNBC, you'd think you were listening to the House organ of the Democratic Party. You listen to Fox News, you'd know you were listening to the House organ of the Republican Party. And this is not good. If, we need, if we're gonna cure our political dysfunction. Lastly, the fine tuning of our redistricting process has left us with a lot of safe congressional seats that virtually guarantee victory by one party or the other and thus push, push candidates further and further away from the center. So you ask, what can we do to revive bipartisanship? What can we do to get back to the way it was when President Ford governed or President Bush governed? In Washington, that's going to take leadership. It's going to take leadership, though, in both parties. Both parties have to be broad gauged enough to be willing to reach out. But guess what? American voters have to also shoulder some responsibility. I think we all need to realize that in a democracy, no one side gets to make all the rules. Our country has survived and thrived for so long in large part 
because we have learned how to compromise on important issues. Ladies and gentlemen, President Ford understood. He knew and understood the need for consensus building. He served our nation when bipartisanship was more than just an empty slogan. And he was a leading practitioner of it. And his perseverance and dignity, even in the face of the very toughest of challenges, remain examples, I think, upon which we can all draw. So today, 101 years after he was born, and almost 40 years after he became president, an office that he did not initially seek, but which he graciously accepted, we remember Gerald Ford as an honest, ethical, and talented public servant. Most of all, we remember him as a leader, as a leader with unquestionable character and integrity. But we also remember him, and perhaps most importantly, as a true American patriot who always, always, always put his country's interests ahead of his own. Our country would be a lot better off today and our future would be a lot brighter tomorrow if our elected officials could call upon those traits that define President Ford's leadership as they confront the difficult challenges that lay ahead. Thank you all very much. May God bless you and may God bless this country that Gerald Ford loves so well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you for being here, sir. I'm delighted to be here. I understand we have time for two questions, um, unless you give very short answers. And we have time for more. You mean I can't make a speech? <laughs> you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, first question. As Secretary of State, you faced the collapse of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. What was the mood in the Bush administration, and what were the biggest challenges to America as a result of that momentous event? Well, I think the, the um, I think we were fortunate uh, that George H. W. Bush was present at the time. He understood. He had been immersed in foreign policy, had extensive experience in it, and he was in, and he was knowledgeable enough to know that uh, when the Berlin Wall came down, he got criticized roundly for not showing more emotions. People said, after all, we've won the Cold War, 40 years of conflict, we win, and you're not dancing on the ruins of the Berlin Wall. He said, I'm not gonna dance on the wall. He said, we got a lot of business still to do with Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, the foreign minister whose funeral I just went to. And, uh, and he was so right. And so we were able to work, continue to work with them from 1989 through uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 to effect a peaceful end of the Cold War. Some people uh, will tell you that it was inevitable that uh, we would win the Cold War. There was nothing, believe me, there was nothing inevitable about it. When we started out in January of 1989, the Soviet Union and the United States were bitter enemies. We were at the height of the Cold War. I never will forget the first meetings I would have with the Soviet foreign minister. There were all these stilted and formal things, large uh, groups of people on each side of the table, and we'd go at each other and butt heads. And by two years later, uh, our, our relationship with the Soviet Union had turned from one of confrontation to one of cooperation. I think it was primarily due to the superb leadership of President Bush. But it also was due uh, to something else very important, and I said this at uh, Edward Shevardnadze's funeral, uh, whenever it was, a few hours ago. <laughs> I said, you know, the, the Cold War would never have ended peacefully 
If Edward Shevardnadze and Mikhail Gorbachev had not made the decision not to use force to keep the empire together, and history will treat both of them very, very well for that decision, because every other Soviet leader up until that time had used force to keep the empire together. What was your favorite thing about being chief of staff? Favorite thing about being chief of staff? Is that what you said? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I characterize that. I've characterized that as the worst job in government. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something about being chief of staff. You may be the second most powerful person in Washington, uh, but your uh, the job is chief of staff. Uh, the, the guys who go in there who've been principals in their own right. They focus on the chief part of that title and not the staff part of that title. And when, the, when you don't focus on the staff part, you lose. But the reason I say it was the worst job in government is because that's, uh, your job is to catch the javelins that are intended for the old man. <laughs> and and when, they can't, when they can't get to the president, they get to the chief of staff. And I also said that when I left the job after four years, two weeks, 10 days, and 10 hours, <laughs> I, I had served longer as chief of staff than anybody in history, and I was the only one who hadn't gone to jail. <laughs> so I was glad to get out. One last question. I don't know if you can top that one. Though. Mm -hmm. Were there any previous secretaries of state uh, in our country's history that you modeled yourself after? I don't think you, you, I could say that I modeled uh, myself uh, uh, as Secretary of State after any particular Secretary of State, but I, w I went around and I talked to every living ex-president and every living ex-Secretary of State before I took the job, and I found that to be immensely uh, helpful to me. Uh, when I was made Secretary of State, people said, what? No foreign policy experience. I said, wait a minute. I was chief of staff for four years. I was secretary of the treasury for four years. You do get a hell of a lot of foreign policy experience in those jobs. You sit on the National Security Council. That still didn't mean they were ready to accept me in the bureaucracy at the State Department. I was sort of a political hack, you know. But, what, but we, because of, my, because of my seamless relationship with President George H.W. Bush, the State Department led foreign policy in his administration. We led the formulation and implementation of it. And so uh, after about a year or two, the career employees, and the State Department is 80% career, so a foreign service officer, and all they really want is to be in on the action. And because of my relationship with President Ford, they were in on the action, and we actually led the formulation and implementation of foreign policy in that administration, so they were happy with it. Uh, is that it? <laughs> That's it. Secchia? You, <laughs> you want me to tell you a story about that? I don't I may get in trouble. <laughs> so, okay, so here, Secchia has helped us, you know, and, and, and President Bush said, you know, it would be fine if we, nice if we could find something for uh, Pete Secchia. I said, it sure would be. He really helped in the campaign. So we appointed him ambassador to Italy. And before he, was, uh, before he was confirmed or sworn in, he was talking to some journalists somewhere, and, he's, and they asked him, well, what do you think about this country you're going to, Mr. Secchi? He said, he said, well, let me just tell you, the only thing I know about Italy is that, do you know why the Italians have glass-bottom boats? And the guy said, no, why? He said, so they can see the rest of the Italian Navy. <laughs> well, I want to tell you something. <laughs> We almost had trouble. We, we almost, they, the Italians almost pulled Agramont away from <laughs> But he served us with great distinction and with great effectiveness when he got over. Thank you.
Well, Mr. Secretary, if we could invite you back up for a few moments. Uh, uh, we we want to keep you on your feet so you don't fall asleep here. And on behalf of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation and in appreciation for delivering the 2014 William Simon Lecture, we would like to present you with a bust of oh, President Ford. Don't worry. Thank you. And now as we, as we uh, approach the close of today's program, I would like to invite the president of Grand Valley State University, Tom Haas, as well as Colonel Ralph Howenstein and the director of the Howenstein Center at Grand Valley, Gleaves Whitney, Whitney, to join us on stage. Gleaves. Secretary Baker, thank you so much for those insightful comments. I think you always take us to school and foreign policy when you speak, and we really appreciate that. I also want to just take a moment to thank Susan and Dick and the Ford family for your hospitality, always supporting what we're doing at the Howenstein Center. We really appreciate that, and I also want to thank the trustees, all the trustees who year in and year out have supported what we do at the Howenstein Center. Thank you so much. I have the distinct honor of reading a citation. Mr. Secretary, you don't get to go back to Houston before you get another award. So I would like to read a citation here for an award that is one of Grand Valley's most prestigious awards, and it's certainly something we're proud of at the Howenstein Center because of Ralph Howenstein's good name. If you'll permit me just to read a few lines of it. Grand Valley State University, through its Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies, is proud to offer the center's most prestigious honor, the Colonel Ralph W. Howenstein Fellowship, to the 61st U.S. Secretary of State, James A. Baker III. He was appointed Secretary of State by President George H.W. Bush in 1989 and served through 1992. And in that role, Secretary Baker successfully oversaw United States foreign policy during the end of the Cold War, as well as in the first Persian Gulf War. Secretary Baker served during an important period of U.S. foreign relations. He was influential in overseeing American foreign policy during those tumultuous and uncertain times. Following communism's downfall in Eastern Europe and the breakup of the Soviet Union, he helped guide this country with a steady hand. Secretary Baker is presently a senior partner in the law firm of Baker Botts in Houston, he is Honorary Chairman of the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1991 and has been the recipient of many other awards for distinguished public service, including the Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government Award. For all his accomplishments, the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies is proud formally to recognize Secretary Baker with this fellowship. Established in 2010 in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Grand Valley State University, the, the founding of the university, the Howenstein Fellowship honors distinguished individuals who have helped shape the policies that have profoundly influenced the course of our nation and our world, and whose leadership and public service are in keeping with the life and the values of Colonel Ralph W. Howenstein.
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our 2014 William Simon Lecture. We are delighted to have you all join us. And Mr. Secretary, congratulations once again. We appreciate your very thoughtful works. Thank you all for joining us.